ಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಧರ್ಮಸ್ವರೂಪಿಣಿ ಅವತಾರವರಿಷ್ಠಾ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾ ತೆ ನಮಃ ವಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣೂರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕೀ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು so we will start with the section which we were discussing in the last class the purpose of the descent of the divine incarnation which has been described in shrimad bhagavad gita from the 7th to the 10th this four shlokas the four verses of the fourth chapter from the 7th to the 10th so in the last class we just had an overview of the 7th and the 8th shlokas which we will again take up today to study it in a bit more details so what's the 7th shloka of the 4th chapter yada yada hi dharmasya glani bhavati bharata abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam srijamya so this is the 7th and the idea is continued in the 8th shloka which also we study and we will try to discuss both the shlokas together the 8th is paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya cha duskritam dharma sangsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge so yada yada hi dharmasya glanir bhavati bharat so whenever there is a decline decline in the righteousness and increase in the unrighteousness so o arjuna bharata that's when i manifest myself on earth abhyutthanam i manifest abhyutthanam means to manifest himself sorry tadatmanam srija srijamyaham is the manifestation abhyutthanam adharmasya to uproot to get to nullify all the unrighteous unrighteousness and to in that we i manifest myself tadatmanam tat atmanam srijamyam atmanam is myself srijamyam i manifest myself and then what are the purpose after manifesting himself that when adharma the context he is mentioning that when adharma is on the rise and righteousness is on decline that's the time when he manifests himself and what's the purpose he serves that's being mentioned in the eighth verse paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya cha duskritam dharma sangsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge so the three things he is mentioning so paritranaya sadhuna to protect the righteous one vinashaya cha duskritam to annihilate the wicked and dharma sangsthapan to re establish the principles of dharma sambhavami yuge yuge is again and again this is the idea which is very unique to hinduism that it's not just for once we cannot restrict the lord his compassion for the beings in this earth this cannot be restricted with just his advent for once whenever he finds that there is a decline of religion there is a decline of righteousness there is a rise of the unrighteousness then to establish the religion he again comes in yugas in again and again in ages we find so now the question is what is dharma so that is the main thing that what is the dharma now in our scriptures dharma has been defined in two ways the first is dharyate iti dharma that which holds us binds us is dharma now what actually it is meant by 
holding us, binding us. Now, if you look at the animal kingdom, this the animal kingdom is guided by their instincts. Just go to the forest, you will find the instincts do have a rule over the forest ecology. The forest ecology is guided by the instincts of the animals. So the lion is basically a predator. It has to feed on some other animals. That's how the plan of nature is. A very interesting, you will find when the lion is attacking its prey and is feeding on its prey, the moment it gets satiated, it will never look back at its prey. So when the lion is feeding on its prey, the scavengers of the forest, the hyenas, the jackals, they're called the scavengers, they clean up. So whatever is left out by the lion, the lion will leave. The ones that is satiated will never look back at its prey. Now these hyenas and the jackals, they come. They have their share. When they are having their share, the vultures are sitting on the top of the branch of the tree, on the branch of the tree. They are also waiting. They know they also have their share. When these scavengers have left, they come down. They also have their share. So you will find, and at last, of course, the decomposition starts. The microbes are also having their uh, nourishment from there. And that is again mixing up with the soil that is increasing its fertil this, this fertility. And the nature, that's how you will find, is recycling itself in that way. Everyone is having their own share. There's a wonderful balance. And there is no one guiding that. The instinct guides us, the animals, naturally. But for human, the rationality, the reason, takes the place of the instinct. Now, what we as a human do? So we go to the market, we go for shopping, and we find that certain fruit or certain vegetable or some of our this rice or whatever it may be, the cereals. So the price has reduced, and we buy a huge amount. We bring it. Either we keep it in our store or in something called the refrigerator, isn't it? It is there. The question of sharing doesn't come. That in the forest we found that the sharing was something natural. We as a human have a tendency to hold, to collect everything. It's not bad. To a certain extent, it is good. Because it is a holding which helps us to sustain our family. It is the holding which helps us to to the, what you say, the nourish all the family members, nurture them, educate them. So many things are, of course, related to that holding. It is good. It's not bad. But we humans don't know the limit. The holding then goes on. It takes the, uh, it manifests as the greed and we go on holding without limits. And then at last we find a society which has turned into a carcinogenic society. What is that carcinogenic society is? You will read everywhere. That 1% of the population is having 99% of the wealth. There are so many movements, this Wall Street move, this Occupy movement, if, if you have heard in the last decade it was there. In the Wall Street, that movement, that what's the Occupy movement? The mass was protesting. That the government policy has to be changed. Because our wealth is being accumulated just by the 1% of the population. It is we who give our labor. The mass is contributing with their labor, with their intelligence. But somehow, the entire wealth is siphoned to just that 1% of the population who is having that 99% of the wealth. So what it speaks of? That human beings, somehow the instinct is very weak. The reason has taken its place. And now, for everything, there has to be laws, regulations, isn't it? Now, the government has to formulate the laws in such a way that that accumulation of wealth doesn't happen. We have to have those dictums. Don't do this. Do this. So, you will find in all the religions, there is some do's and don'ts. The, in the Abrahamic religion, you find the commandments. 
In Hindu religion, you will find the vidhis and the nishedhas. These are the things which has to be there to guide us. Otherwise, we tend to disintegrate. So now you will understand the idea dhariyate iti dharma means that which holds us, that which binds us. We need all those regulations, the do's and don'ts, which will guide us. That laws has to be there, as in the last laws we were saying, to make us orient towards the principle. What is the principle? The principle is something divine. It's not, again, man-made or human-made. It is divine. What is the principle? So this, yeah, what do you say? Saha Yagya Praja. We have studied in the second chapter. Saha Yagya Praja Srishtva Puro Vacha Prajapati. That when the Lord created this universe, which was created, He created it with the idea of Yagya along with it. Saha Yagya Praja Srishtva. Along with Yagya, He created the Praja the one who will be procreating and sustaining the nature. Praja, Prajayanti is Praja. So he created along with the Yajna. And as you remember when we were discussing that chapter, Yajna doesn't mean simply that fire sacrifice. What's the idea of the Yajna? In the fire sacrifice, what's the principle behind it? That I offer some oblations in the fire and those appellations are carried by the fire and they take it to the devas, the celestial beings. They're the personification of nature, like the rain god, the wind god, the sun god. And they, in return, give us everything in bounty, just as much as it is needed. Not too much, not too less. Too much means flood, less means drought. So everything he gives us as we need. Why? that we also to propitiate them is offering them in the form of fire. So how much it is true, let us forget about it. And whether it's really such thing happens, let us forget about it. But what's the basic principle behind it? The idea is of the yajna means give and take. That I am giving something and return, I receive something. So this is the idea which was elaborated in the Satapata Brahman. And there, they give the meaning of yajna as something where this, this entire creation is actually bound by that. The idea of interdependence, that nothing can stand alone in this universe. The constant, this interaction, this interdependence is going on. A tree, you just a lump of soil where Yashoda, when found in the Krishna's mount, a lump of soil, he saw the entire universe there, Vishwarup Darshan. If we have the eyes of Yashoda, we can see how the lump of soil is formed. Where there is no life, there cannot be any soil. It is the decomposed organic matter which in time gets converted into soil. So when there is soil, it means there was some plant that has died and decomposed. Where there is plant, there must be sun. There must be oxygen. There, this environment must be there. All the minerals must be there. And not a single mineral has been created on this earth. They are the stardust. So we all are at last the stardust. As I heard when I went for some uh, lecture by George Smoot, a Nobel laureate, he came to India. He was addressing the students. And he asked the students, do you want to see an alien? And the students, of course, were very enthusiastic. There's so many raised their hands. And George Smoot then immediately told, go and stand in front of the mirror. Because nothing, not a single this element with which we are constituted, if we take this physical body to be our entity, not a single atom has been created on this earth. We are all stardust. So what's the idea? The idea of interdependence, that is the idea of the yajna. So with this idea of this yajna, this creation has been there. So we have to synergize. We have to interdepend upon each other and that results in the win-win situation. When we cooperate, when we synergize, you overcome your limitation, I overcome my limitation and that way we both win. So that's the idea of synergy <clears throat> which is behind the idea of yajna and which again constitutes 
the very basic principle of creation. Now, just the way as I cannot break the physical laws, they are there. The law of gravitation, the law of electromagnetism. If someone says that, let me jump from a 20 story building, I don't believe in gravitation. He's not believing in gravitation, doesn't entail that he will be flying. Whether you believe or not, you are going to that, a gravitation is there that is going to act upon you, you're going to crash and die. So laws are something which cannot be broken. It is there. So when in Bhagavad Gita, it is mentioned that Saha Yajna Prajasrishtva, it means it is a basic law. You cannot break it. Now, the entire animal world by their instinct is following it. But as reason has taken the place of instinct, we tend to break those laws, but we cannot break them. At last we will find it is we who are suffering. The entire society has become carcinogenic. And like in a cancer patient, you find that the few cells have start growing beyond the rate in which it is supposed to grow at last to form tumor. And that results in the death of the patient along with the death of the tumor cells. The same thing happens with the society. With the accumulation of the wealth, the, everything is going to disintegrate. The, the society is to fall off. So to integrate it, dharyate, I need those basic laws. So that is the one principle of dharma. So we need the dharma. So now you will understand the question of righteousness and unrighteousness. Why it comes? If is the plan of the universe, if the Lord has created the universe and it is his plan to sustain it, it has to, he has to, his advent is a must where he takes care of this imbalance which happens from time to time as we tend to break those, tend to go beyond those laws because of our greed, because of our, uh, what you say, all this greed, too much of greed, we always tend to break the laws. So that's the thing which is spoken of as the first thing, uh, first principle of dharma. There's an, another idea of dharma as a human being. That is vishishyate eti dharma. There's a second idea. What is vishishyate eti dharma? Vishishyate. The unique characteristic of any thing is its dharma. Dharma means characteristic. Like water. To flow is the dharma of water. Water means it will flow. Fire means it will give heat. So the giving heat, the heat is the dharma of fire. Similarly, as a human being, we have some unique characteristic which defines us, which doesn't define any other creation, some uniqueness. What is that? We as a human being cannot be satisfied with the basic necessities of life. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Khali pete dharma hoena. Khali pete dharma. What does it mean? That as long as you're hungry, as long as your basic needs are not met, you cannot think, have, think of the higher meaning, higher purpose of life. Because the basic needs has to be met. But what it, in, what it implies that once the basic needs are met, now as a human being, I cannot remain satisfied. The urge to know the meaning of existence from where we came, where we are destined, what's the essence of our being? These are the questions which are going to lurk. We cannot stop them. We cannot stifle them. With the wor world at present, with all its materialism, denying religion, denying spirituality, but know it for certain, whether we loudly speak of it or not, you'll find this question now and then is coming in all of us. We are constituted that way. We cannot stop it. Swami Vivekananda used to say in one of his, in quite a few of his lectures, this line is there, religion is the basic necessity of human beings. Just as I cannot live with, without food, I cannot live without water, I cannot live without air, I cannot live without religion. Religion in the sense of spirituality. It has to. Swamiji is saying that our life is just like an adventurous journey through a mountainous terrain. <clears throat> and suddenly in our life, today or tomorrow, at some moment, we come just at the age of a precipice and we cannot proceed. 
some near and dear ones die, pass away. We were, we took it for granted that this relation is going to be there forever. Suddenly it comes, it's gone. The question is bound to come. What after that? We will find there are such moments in life where we have to ask that question. And as a human being, we cannot stifle it. We cannot deny it. You know, in the uh, time of this Russia's communist government for 60 years, religion was banned. No religion. And the moment that ban was taken off, you will find all sorts of church denominations have started bubbling, means so much. You cannot, just by saying that there won't be any religion, by force, you cannot take, because there's a tremendous hunger for it within us. And that is what is meant by the second meaning of dharma. That as a human being, we are constituted in such a way that we have to, today or tomorrow, we cannot deny it in the name of gross materialism, however we may dive deep, that question is there. As long as death is there, that question will be there in each and every human being. As Swami Vivekananda used to give a nice example, that sometimes when the death is there, we do uh, have that question, what after that? But somehow to stifle it, to stop it, we try to keep ourselves engaged in a lot of social activities, lot of sensual pursuits of life. And it is like Swami Vivekananda is saying a very nice thing. It is just like a rabbit. When it is chased by a predator, the rabbit runs and runs. And at last, when it finds that it can run no more, it is going to be devoured by the predator. It has almost caught up. The rabbit will somehow dig a hole and hide its mouth in the hole, yeah, or its face in the hole. The moment it hides its face in the hole, it cannot see the predator and it thinks I am safe. Swamiji is saying that all our social engagements, all our so-called this endeavors for our happiness in the sunset world is just like the mouse trying to hide its face in the hole, thinking that it is safe. I may not look at it, but it is there. The death is chasing us. As long as it's chasing us, know it for certain that we cannot hide that question will come now and then and that is the second idea the religion which is as a human being as a basic necessity <clears throat> once our basic need is met that question is bound to come so now adharma is what so with the these are the from these two aspects of dharma adharma can be de defined in two ways the first is that that we forget the do's and don'ts, the vidhis, the principles which is guiding the universe, we forget and we start becoming unlawful and then adharma rises and the dharma is in the decline. Then again to establish dharma, the God has to come. It is, his, it, it is he and he alone who can again set the, set the thing in its correct perspective. That's the one thing that is been prescribed in the seventh and in the eighth verse that to get rid of the wicked, to protect the righteous, and to establish the religion. So he comes down. So that is the this first aspect, Dharyateti Dharma. That for that aspect, this for this two sloka has described that the seventh and the eighth. The ninth and the tenth, which we'll take up today. That takes care of the religion as has been defined in the second aspect, the Vishishyateti Dharma. That I cannot stay satisfied with this so-called sensate plane of existence. There is a spiritual dimension of our existence. To that we have to relate if we have to find the answers of all the big riddles of life, big questions of life. That life poses so many big questions. And we find no answer. Why we don't find answer? We get this, this answer because we are never trying to relate to that spiritual dimension of existence. To give an example, in a classroom, the teacher asks the students that try to, uh, try to draw exactly four triangles by joining four points. You may try, you will find it's never possible. Somehow the two lines will intersect to create the fifth point. 
and there will be more than four triangles at any cost. So the answer is the teacher himself gives the answer. What's the answer? So you have to draw just uh, three points in the plane, in the page. And you have to imagine the fourth point in the space. Now you join, you get a triangular pyramid with exactly four triangular faces. So why the students couldn't answer? <clears throat> because they were searching their answer only in the this two dimension of the page. They never thought that we have to take into consideration the third dimension. So in our life, the, all the big questions remain unanswered <clears throat> because we never take the third dimension, the another dimension, the spiritual dimension of our existence into account. And that's the result. That's why we don't find the answers to the questions. And to take care of that third dimension, the next two verse, that's Sri Krishna will be speaking the reason of his advent. So what's the next two verse? <clears throat> that's the ninth is Janma Karma Chami Divyam Evang Yo Vetti Tatvata Tyatva Dehang Punar Janma Naiti Mameti Sarjuna. So the coming down of the avatar, the advent of the divine is for the rising up of the entire humankind. He comes down so that we can hold on to his Leela and rise up in our spirituality. So, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Leela dhore dhore nitte pochan. Hold on to the Leela, uh, hold on to the Leela to reach the Nitya. The God comes down, his advent, his, uh, the two things are there, that he has no as such desires we, our desires force us to take birth. All the samskaras, the latent impressions, that's the thing which decides, which gravitates us down again to this physical plane of existence. God has no desire. So what's uh, the thing which results in his advent? As even the last class we were indicating that you can never have a pure gold ornament some amount of alloy has to be added to it. So God also has to have some desire to come down. And the desire which he has is unbound love, compassion for the human being, seeing them suffering. It is just this compassion. That's the thing you can say as the alloy, which brings him down again to this plane of existence. So when he comes down, if we can understand his life, that he's actually an actor. In Bhagavata, they say he's Kapata Purusha. He's an imposter. When God is an imposter. Why is an imposter? Because he knows that he is playing just a role. He's not the one uh, who is impersonated as that person. He's just playing that role. He's an, so that's why they call him a Kapata Purusha. Just someone who is trying to act as someone else. He is called an imposter. So here, God has been called as an imposter, Kapata Purusha. Why? Maya Manushya Hari. Because these are very wonderful times. Maya. He resorts to Maya. That word Maya we were defining. Ya means Yatha Yatha. <clears throat> Ma is the negation. So what I'm seeing is not the essence. It is just appearing. He's taking that form, coming down, and he's just playing a role, which is his lila. This is divine sport. One who understands that, <coughs> realizes that, as Sri Ramakrishna used to say a very nice thing, that the, my, the, the, the devotees who come here, they have to know only three things, only three things. What are the three things? Who am I? Who they are? And what is the relationship between this? Nothing else. Who am I? Who you are? And what's the relation between you and I? That's what has been spoken even in the Upanishads. Tattvamasi. <clears throat> By this Tattvam Padhartha Shodhanam. Tattvamasi. That you are God. 
You can never be God. But the essence of the divine is that conscious principle. The essence of me is that conscious principle. So if you re just remove the adjuncts, that Lord is the ruler of the universe. So these adjuncts, these adjectives, the ruler, you remove that. What remains the conscious principle? I am a limited being. I have lots of uh, limitations, desires. Remove those adjuncts. What remains is that consciousness. So this tattvam padartha shodhanam. What remains that consciousness? So once you realize that, you are one with that conscious principle. So to make us aware of the divine essence, which is within us, the is the purpose of the Lord's advent so that we can find the meaning of life, the meaning of existence. So that's the thing for which this <clears throat> ninth verse is saying, Janma Karma Chame Vidyam. See, the Bhagavad Gita mentions of Maya as of two types. Sri Ramakrishna says that it is almost impossible to transcend Maya. If you have to transcend Maya, hold on to the Maya Dhish the Lord of the Maya. The one who is the Lord of the Maya, you have to hold on to him. This Maya, this, uh, if you have to go beyond Maya, get hold of the Maya Dhish. In Bhagavad Gita, they, are, they will find this, they are mentioning there's two types of Maya, two types of Maya. What are they? One is the Guna Maya and another is the Atma Maya. Guna Maya is something which binds us, the three Gunas, <clears throat> Sattva Rajatama, that constitute the entire universe. What actually it means, we all say this Sattva Rajatama, these are the three things which binds us. What actually it means? Sattva in our scriptures, we don't, we won't go to the detailed discussion just now. In, in time, in due course, whenever the context comes, we will go to the dis discussion. But let us try to understand from the present uh, academic educations which we have, what Sattva Rajatamas mean. Sattva, in our scriptures say illumination. You all agree it is illumination. Rajas is action and Tamas is darkness. Now, we are not born with a mind which is vacant. All the impressions are there. When you are in deep sleep, your mind is not vacant. All the impressions are there. But it is in a state of Tamas. In the morning, you wake up, you look out through your window, you see in your garden a nice flower, a nice rose. What has happened? That all the impressions which were dark, this illumination, now what is it doing? That, so that light is falling, uh, that's, uh, the, is falling on your eyes and that impression in your brain it goes and it strikes the so-called color perception center. See the light has not entered there. It is just some nerve current. And that thing which was in the dark, it gets illumined. Something in your brain, the color is not being perceived which is outside. Actually, what is outside we can never know. The red flower, that red flower, that red color is not entering into your brain. Its work starts to the moment, its work stops the moment it touches your eyes. The light doesn't enter the brain. The light, when it touches your eyes, it gets converted into that nerve current, optic nerve current. It is that nervous current which is going to the so-called color center and the color is not perceived there. It is totally dark. If that particular sensation is immediately projected as that red color, it goes and envelops the object to give you the feeling that it is red. So all the perceptions which are happening is not something from outside within. Something is stimulating. But what we are seeing is what we are projecting, isn't it? So what has happened? That the mind which was dark, because of some stimuli, it gets illumined. So they, you will have, you will heard in the scriptures, they say sattva rajas tamas are mutable. They're constantly, one is getting converted to the other. So the tamas, the mind which was in tamas, now gets converted into sattva, that illumination. And now as per your temperament, what you are doing, I go out, pluck the flower. I like to just keep a vase in the dining table. You may keep it there. Or you are a devotee, you may go and keep it in the altar. So all these actions, this speaks of rajas. So sattva, that the entire universe is nothing but the three gunas. From the from our present educational point of view, this academic education point of view, we can very, very easily understand this world is nothing but 
stimuli response conditioning. What's what speaks of life? Stimuli response conditioning. A rock is not responding to anything. I respond. How it has happened? Now the, the, in the scriptures, there is coming into the, the an explanation that the conscious principle, the moment it gets reflected in the psychophysical existence, it creates that ahamta, that reflection. The sun, there are hundreds of waves in the ocean, but there's only one sun. That one sun is getting reflected in each of the waves. And if you look at the reflection, there are thousands of reflections. So the one sun appears as thousand suns if you are uh, identifying your existence with the reflection. That reflection speaks of asmita. And now that reflection thinks itself to be one with that psychophysical existence. That once, once that conscious principle, which is one and non-dual, that is reflected in each and every being. And that consciousness, you know, is very interesting. We can know only the reflection. We cannot know the exact light. There's a nice uh, uh, episode in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. One day Ramakrishna is asking Girish Ghosh, suppose there is a sun and there are 10 jars full of water. So how many reflections are there and uh, how that's, uh, that, that's, uh, how many sun and how many reflections? Well, of course, one sun and 10 reflections I have. Well, I remove one jar, break one jar. So there are nine jars now. So there are nine reflections, one sun. So at last, Sri Ramakrishna says one jar. So Krishna of course replies, one reflection, one sun. And they said that last jar is also broken. What is there? Girish naturally replies, one sun. Ramakrishna says, no, you cannot say what is there. It is only because of the reflection I know the sun is there. Means these are very this these things we should try to understand because these are the very basics of Vedanta. That you say that the light, we say that light is there. I can never know the existence of light unless it is falling on something and it makes it shine. We never know. You may say now in this now in the daytime I see everything is lighted because the earth surface has an, its own atmosphere. The light is falling in the atmosphere. And that's why the atmosphere is getting lighted up. We see the light everywhere. You go to the moon, they don't have any atmosphere. Even in the daytime, the sky is dark in moon because there's no atmosphere. So only when it falls on something, we know the existence of light. Otherwise we don't know light. When something is falling, then only we know the existence of gravitation. Otherwise we don't know the existence of gravitation. In a magnetic field, when the iron filings are being attracted, then only we know the existence of magnet. Otherwise we don't know the existence of magnet. Similarly, the conscious principle, when it gets reflected to the psychophysical existence, that reflection gives us the idea of the conscious principle. That's why when no pot is there, you don't know what is there. Because till the island firings are not there, you don't know of magnetism. Till something was falling, you don't know what gravitation is. Till something is illumined, you don't know what light is. Similarly, the conscious principle, the ultimate, uh, the basic foundation, you can never know. It is the Eternal subject can never be known. And it can only be known when it has been objectified, when it has been reflected in something. So when it reflects in the body-mind complex, then that ego evolves. I am. And now something behind is saying, you are eternal. There is no death for you. And I hear the ego is saying, there is no death for you. And what happens? I shout from the mountain, the same voice comes, isn't it? Now from the body-mind complex, that ego is coming your eternal. And now it gets deluded. It starts thinking that this body-mind complex is eternal. That's what we are trying to do with all our medical science, everything. Every day you'll open that there is something called biological age, there's something called actual age. You can reduce your biological age. You can have more long life. We are doing the same thing. We want to realize that eternity through this body-mind complex. Even a small bacteria is doing the same thing. In a petri dish, the bacteria are moving haphazardly. It's almost impossible to say whether they are just dust particles or their life. To understand whether they are life or not, you put a drop of nutrient in the center of the petri dish. Now look through the microscope. You will find the so-called haphazardly moving particles, which you thought to be particles. They have gathered a direction. They're moving towards. So now you know, stimuli response conditioning. The world is nothing but sattva rajatama. That's working there. 
and it gets the direction. It is moving towards. You put a toxin, it goes away from it. But why this has happened? Because of the ignorance, that real, the consciousness which is behind the bacteria, which is behind me, that doesn't need uh, anything to sustain it. It is always there. It is eternal. Well, that is, this is the, what is truth, which is Trikala Vadita, whose existence cannot be interrupted by any phase of time, past, present, and future. It was, it is, it will be. So that is there. The moment it gets identified with the body mind complex, then this stimuli response conditioning is coming. You are in the bound of the Sattva Rajatama. And that is again Maya, because it is not the fact. The fact is that I am, even this body falls off, I am. As I'm identifying with this, all this is happening. So what is it is? That what I am perceiving is not the truth. That's why it is Maya. Yatha, it is not Yatha Yatha. You are not seeing the thing as it is. So we are all bound by the Guna Maya. And there's another Maya that is called Atma Maya. Now the Lord to break this delusion has to come again and again as an actor. He resorts to the same Maya, that Maya is not something separate from the Lord. The Lord has projected the universe and when he has projected the universe, it is along with the Maya. So he takes, he resorts to the Maya. It doesn't affect him. In the simple words of Ramakrishna, that the snake, which a venomous snake, which bites you, you are getting poisoned. You will die because of that poison. But the snake is carrying that venom all the time. It doesn't affect it. So the one who is the possessor of the Maya, from whom the Maya has been projected, Maya cannot affect him. He resorts to the Maya and comes down to take, to play a role as the Kapata Purusha. He's just playing a role. And two, so that we can resort to that Maya. Sri Ramakrishna is to give a nice example. He's to say, suppose you are drowning. You have fallen on the river and you are drowning <clears throat> and you are just almost at the verge of death, suffocating. And suddenly you find someone has thrown a chain in the water. So what we do? I hold onto the rungs of the chain one by one to come out of it. So he's saying the Leela of the Lord is that chain, the rungs holding onto which we can come out of this. So he comes down so that we hold onto that rungs and come up. So this is the idea which will be uh, described in details in the ninth uh, and the tenth of the slokas of the fourth chapter. So Bhagavan himself is saying that Daivi Yesha Gunamai Mama Maya Duratyaya. That this Maya is Daivi. It is almost impossible for the human being to overcome it, to go beyond it. Mama Maya Duratyaya. Mameva, what's the way out? Mameva ye prapadyante, Maya etam tarantite. The one who holds on to the Lord, he alone can come out of it. What actually is speaking, we can understand these ideas very well with some allegories. There's an allegory of Plato. The Plato's allegory of the cave, five cavemen. The five cavemen, they were enchained from their very birth in such a way that the cave, the opening of the cave, their, their back is on the, toward from, uh, on the opening of the cave. They cannot see what's outside the cave. The, what they can see is only the wall of the cave. There's a, there's, a, there's a gate to enter into the cave and there's a wall of the cave. So they are facing the wall of the cave. So they can see only the wall. They have been enchained in such a way they cannot turn their head. They only can see the wall. Now, by the uh, side of the cave, there is a road. It goes from the village to the marketplace. And on the other side of the road, that's one side of the road is the cave. On the other side of the road, uh, always some fire is burning. There is some fire which is always burning. So now whoever passes that road, because of the fire, his shadow will fall on the wall, isn't it? Because the fire is always burning. So they can hear, this caveman can hear only the noise. The carts are moving and the persons are traveling, they're talking. So they can hear the noise and they can see the shadows, nothing else. And these five cavemen, 
they are for them the world is these shadows they think this is the world nothing else because they have seen nothing else this noise and these shadows and they think this is the reality and one day somehow one of the caveman his chain was removed somehow it was removed he turned around and he was overwhelmed to see this wonderful landscape mountains everything he went out ran he was ecstatic and he came back and told those four people that you are just seeing the shadows it's not the reality and this four men told he has gone mad he has gone mad because they cannot relate and that's the idea even in bhagavad gita that most of us even when god comes down and says that there is a realm beyond this we don't believe and that's in the very nicely it has been told in the uh, 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 in the ninth chapter yeah that's i have noted that there is a sloka in the ninth chapter that avajananti yes avajananti mangmura manushing tanumasritam param bhavam ajananta so this is that they don't know my param bhava that my my real nature so they they because they're always seeing the enchained in this but as we told that second uh, definition of dharma is vishishyate that most of us are quite absorbed in it but as we told we can never remain satisfied for a few if not all that question has started coming in their life is there is this everything is nothing beyond that it is for them the of the purpose of the advent of the avatar <clears throat> it is those for whom that spiritual quest has developed <clears throat> there's a nice example in the life of gautam buddha <clears throat> gautam buddha after nirvana immediately after nirvana he thought that after all everything is what i am seeing is maya that he also realized that it is not as it is it is just a reflection a projection i have realized the reality so what's the need of continuing with my life that's one thing and second thought came but my realization if i relate to the world they will be benefited so why not continue then again another thought came but will they realize it will be just like the cave man who was somehow released and was trying to relate others were denying they told he has gone mad so buddha also thought the same thing that most prob these people won't be relating so in in that case again there is no need to continue with the life first for my own for my self purpose there is no need for others also i cannot help they cannot relate to it so what's the purpose then the third thought came yes most won't will be rejecting me ridiculing me but there will be few just the way i had that quest what's there after life there are a few who have that quest but for them they have no answer it is they who will be benefited those few if you have read in the abraham maslow's uh, pyramid of needs you find the same idea the most that in the pyramid as you go up it becomes narrow the apex is just a point but the idea that in a pyramid the base is very broad as you go up it becomes narrow so he's saying the abraham maslow is saying it is a pyramid of needs also for the human kind most of us are happy with the sense that world that's the best gradually you may get some intellectual happiness that's not all from that some some gets a happiness from creating something this all the performing arts and all so that way you will find as you grow higher and higher your your needs become more and more sublime you get more this lesser and lesser number of people but there are some though it is becoming less but there are some who are near that apex there are few but they also need that help to come out of this maze of this worldly existence we are almost in a maze we travel and then we find we are almost in a dead block end there is no way out so unless god comes and helps us out 
it is almost impossible to come out of the maze. So there are a few who are trying hard to come out of this maze. And for them, because he has to come down, because we cannot hold on to that abstract principle. God is, unless he comes down, he is abstract. It is very difficult to hold on to him. And that's why that we studied in the sixth mantra in this same chapter that Ajopi, son of Vyayatma, Bhutanam Ishwarupi son, that though I am Aja, I'm unborn, I'm of Vya, I'm decaying. There is no need for me to born. Prakriting Swam Adhishthaya, this for those few who have developed that tremendous urge, Vyakulata, Mumukshata, Mumukshutvam, for the liberation, to come out of this maze. It is for them, I resort to my own Prakriti. I get hold of my own Prakriti <clears throat> and Prakriti Swam Adhishthaya Sambhavami Atma Maya. The Maya with which I have deluded the world with the same Maya I come down to find, uh, to help those people who are in search of the way. And once those people who are really in need of this, they relate to my life. It is only they who can relate. Others cannot relate. As Ramakrishna, from Sharadananda Ji, he was a direct disciple of Ramakrishna. So someone came much later. Ramakrishna has passed away. Just Sharadananda Ji was the general secretary. He was staying in Ubbodhan. And someone came and just casually told, we came for doing Sadhu Sangha. And Sharadananda Ji's reply was wonderful. He told, <clears throat> when Ramakrishna was in Dakshineshwar. The temple priests were there. So many administrative, uh, these people, uh, admi this temple administration people were there. They every day saw Ramakrishna. They thought he's mad. He's a lunatic person. <coughs> so they were all staying with him almost 24 hours. So Sadhu Sangha doesn't mean just staying near him. You have to know, you have to recognize. And how can you recognize? Till that urge has developed, you cannot recognize. Today we have the seminar. I will just tell a story and stop and give some time for that gap. And then we'll continue with the seminar and the Gita subject. Of course, we will continue with the next class. The story is a very interesting story of Ramakrishna. In the gospel is there that a rich man has his own servant. And one day he gave him a stone and told just go to the marketplace and ask what's its worth. So he went to the eggplant seller. So the eggplant seller, he just saw the stone and tried to just inspect, investigate it. And then at last, after inspecting, he told, wisely he told, I can give you at the most nine eggplants, not more than that. He told, why, you give me 10? No, oh, no, no, no. I have already uh, told you some beyond the actual price. Ah. Yes, I've just, I'm going to give you this nine eggplant is quite costly. This something which is, uh, if you barter it, I'm giving you actually more. So now this man returned, they went back and told he is going to give nine eggplants. So he told after all, he's an eggplant seller. What, how can he just really know his value? So then he wrote, okay, we go to the cloth merchant. The cloth merchant again, seeing it, he told, okay, I can give you thousand rupees or thousand dollars, whatever it is. So he came back, he told, how can he know? And then he told, he took take it to the jeweler. When he went to the jeweler, just seeing, he told, it's 100,000, it's immediately just seeing it. And what's the idea behind this allegory? Only the jeweler knows the worth of that stone. The Holy Mother used to say very nicely that the villagers used to go to the village pond to have their regular, you know, the deep to bathe there. And there was a stone just by this in the ghat just in the bank of that uh, pond. And you, they have to, you know, that uh, uh, clean their legs. It was a bit coarse. So they used to rub their legs on that rock to clean it. One day some jeweler came and found it's a precious diamond. So only, so for most of us, Avajananti, they have not yet developed that test. God comes, you don't realize that he is. But if you do realize, it's about them in the ninth and the tenth sloka is mentioned that janma karma chame uh, this uh, this janma karma chame divyam evam yo vetti tattvata 
त्यक्ता देहं पुनर्जन्म नैति मामेति सोर्जन से ही हु दस नोस ट्रूली द डिवाइन बर्थ एंड एक्शन ऑफ माइंड जन्म कर्म वट इज द डिवाइन बर्थ दट ही हैज like us he has not been forced to this birth that's why it is divine our actions force us we are gravitated down to this plane of existence because of our samskaras he has come willingly without any desires it's just a spontaneity just for leela he has came down so that's janma is divya and karma is also divya we are our karma is because of getting some results we are the we think we are the karta and we are the bhukta for enjoyment whatever i am doing for my personal enjoyment god has nothing he doesn't have that idea of enjoyership as per the the sensate plane of existence is concerned then why he has come down for this three purpose out of compassion to re establish religion and to get rid of the unrighteousness <clears throat> some this and to establish religion again to its pristine glory he comes down so that's why his karma is also divya one who knows that for him there is no more rebirth that's the atyatva once he leaves this body punar janma there is name no more rebirth naiti mahameti sojana the 10th shloka also will be a continuation of this idea so this 9th and the 10th this shlokas give that real purpose of the advent of the divine as sri ramakrishna used to say very nicely the elephant has the task but the task is almost a show it's most at the most it can help it helps to protect itself but for nourishing itself for its food the teeth which are not visible that is inside with that it will be just chewing the food that's not visible so avatar has two purpose this task is this like this dharma sangsthapana to get rid of the um, dushkritam to protect the righteous so these are the task external task but that is just something which the world sees but for the few like the gopis which has been spoken of in the bhagavatam those who really have in uh, communion with the divine so they are like that inner tip with which the elephant nourishes god comes down the leela has two purpose it is not just only to liberate a few of the souls he himself like to relish he that's why he comes down the in in some way you know that the, the idea of avatar that why he has kept us in maya the story i very much like again and again i repeat it is the story of the in the bible the story of this idea is there even in our scripture <clears throat> but the story is something which very nicely depicts it that god is was alone but he is bliss all the bliss which comes from the heart seeing your child you feel that bliss seeing your near and dear one that bliss emanates that pure bliss is something which is divine how uh, that bliss gets uh, manipulated in this world that's different but the pure bliss is divine god is bliss say so this raso vaisa so that bliss now now in life anything which is blissful it cannot enjoy by itself its own bliss the bliss whenever there is a bliss the happiness you, there has to be two so god to enjoy his own bliss created this universe when he was alone he became many and when he became many what was the purpose so that to enjoy his own bliss he became many so that he can relate now the question is if that's so then why we are not feeling attraction towards the divine if god has made the creation in such a way that we relate to him in love we don't feel attraction we go towards the world the reason is you can never love a computer an artificial intelligence can you love <clears throat> even artificial intelligence is designed in such a way that it is going to always love you unconditional love you always will notice a machine however it may have unconditional love you know it's machine you can never reciprocate that love real love can only happen when there is a question of choice 
I love you, you have a choice. You may reciprocate, you may not reciprocate. And when you reciprocate, then only the love is experienced. So God created us with the choice. And he created the world perfectly imperfect. We go out. We may go out and however we may try, however, lives after lives, we may try. Perfectly imperfect. You can never get happiness. Know it for certain. There are many Babas and all who will say, uh, do this, do that, and you get happiness. It's all bogus. At last, uh, you will find these are all patchworks. Yes, maybe for a little time. And again, that's suffering. Till now, with any Baba's blessing, who is enjoying an eternal life? No one. Uh, however, he may bless at last. He himself has to die. And then that I read in paper that God dies of diabetes. Someone declared him God, and at last he dies in diabetes. The paper heading is God dies in diabetes. So this is our fate at last. So we cannot. So that's so the, I, the idea is we, this world is perfectly imperfect. And at last, we have to turn around. And this again is a matter of choice. We turn around and then God is waiting when we turn around. It is not we, he who comes running to come as embraces. The story of that, uh, that prodigal child. There's a rich man had two children, two child, uh, two son. The elder one was obedient. He's a Nitya Siddha. He's obedient. He's always uh, with his father. The young one, he wants a free life. He gets a share of the father's property. Though father was not willing to share, he disobeyed him. He challenged him. He took a share of his property, ran away. And after a few years, he was not a responsible person. He wasted his wealth. He became pauper. And now he was afraid. If I go back to my father, he will kick me. I have disobeyed him. I wasted his wealth. But there's no other way. As there's no other way, he's with all fear, he's coming back <coughs> from a distance. Father sees him and he's so happy. He runs, goes and embraces the child because to celebrate the comeback, the coming back of his child is a huge fist. So that's the story in the Bible. So now you will understand that why this Maya, the same thing. We are going out. But again, at the same time, that Something is there in this going out is that you cannot get happiness there. You have to turn around and to experience the bliss which comes out of your choice to turn back. It is he who comes around. Sri Ramakrishna says, if you go towards God one step, he will come running 16 steps. It is he who comes and embraces us. That's why you will find Gopala is with hands, what is spread out. If you see the Gopala, we go to God with hands spread out. And now you go to Gopala, you find it's just the opposite. He is spreading his hand. The idea is, it is not we who are waiting for him. He is waiting for that love. He is waiting. When we turn around and he is going to embrace us. So that's the idea with which this ninth and the tenth slokas will be elaborated. So this Gita is a wonderful scripture. This has so many layers of understanding. It can synthesize so many of our faculties to give an, uh, an all-round personality. Bhakti, Jnana, everything mixed together. So we will continue with this study again in the next class. Just let us have five minutes break and then we will come back for the uh, seminar on resilience.